Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us again as we continue to study through the names of God. Uh, again, we're doing this with the intent of giving us some resources and some tools to grow in our faith, to grow in our courage, uh, so that we can transition from being cowardly, uh, like we saw the apostles right after the resurrection. That's when we started this, right after Easter, uh, to become courageous and become bold uh, and be able to stand even more firmly. Uh, because we understand who God is and how God provides for us. Today is Adonai. Adonai is a name of God that many people know, uh, it, mainly because it's, probably, it's popular in terms of songs, uh, but it is also the most commonly used name of God. Adonai means absolute ruler or sovereign Lord. It gives across the connotation of an absolute ruler or an owner complete control. You know, as Americans, we don't, we don't really understand that because we don't have a monarchical society uh, based upon a king or a queen or anything along those lines. Uh, so sometimes it's hard for us to fully grasp, but certainly the Hebrews understood that in, in this day and age, as well as, as when Christ was alive, uh, they understood what that meant to have that absolute ruler that, that was in control, at least humanly in control. We know that God is sovereign, but Adonai is a, is a name of God that it expresses that sovereignty. And in fact, it's a deeper word than El Ohim, which is what we did the first week. So they both have a lot of connotation as to being in total control. Adonai, as we're going to study today, is the personal Lord, the personal ruler uh, that we get the privilege of submitting to. So we're going to unpack that. And, and, and look into what that, what that looks like to have a relationship with Adonai. First, I want to I wanna bring to bear a concept, quorum Deo, uh, that is Latin, uh, and it means in the presence of God. The reason I, I want to share that with you today is that God that's, that's used um, is it's, it's, a, it's a derivative because in the Greek, we have kurios, which is in the New Testament. So, very few of the Old Testament names of God that we find in the New Testament, but this is one that we do. It's just called Kurios, which is another, you know, again, Karam. It's, it's something some similar there. So uh, kind of interesting that this concept of an ever-present, ever-omnipotent, omnipresent, those attributes of God, the singular God, have, have been known to, to mankind, to humanity, since the beginning. We've messed it up because we want to go our own way and we're rebellious. We see the effects of rebellion, don't we? Look and open your eyes at society today. We live in open rebellion. Sadly, it breaks many of us, it breaks our heart. So quorum Deo is to, to get back into the idea that we're in the presence of God, the very presence that it's like, it's more than just being in water because it's even more all encompassing. Okay. But for us, for my limited mind, I'm trying to get across the point that God's omniscient and omnipresent and omnipotence is wholly complete in and of himself. And he is outside of everything because he made everything. So Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29, many of you are familiar with that particular verse, but let's read a, around it. Come to me, all who labor, and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am gentle, lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. As I mentioned, Adonai is the most common name found. It's 432 instances that I could find, uh, and there may be more, because again, it may be spelled slightly differently, but over 400. I, I went through and found them, and it's pages and pages and pages in the spreadsheet. It's 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 again, it is the most common and it's, it's, in, it's on purpose because of all the things that we need to understand. We need to understand that the creator, God, is in control. He is our master. We are his servants. And to say that out loud really chafes on probably American culture. I guess it probably chafes on all human culture, but in particular Americans, I think that we really struggle with this concept of I have to submit myself to someone else's authority, someone else's control. And we don't do that real well when we're talking about between humans. And unfortunately, we probably do it even less well 
when we're talking about our Heavenly Father. Christ comes and says, are, are you weary? In fact, this week, as I was studying and the Lord kind of just was speaking to me, it was as everything going on in the past seven to 10 days in this country has, has really refocused rightfully. So the need for us to focus on and be aware of where others struggle, where others are not treated equitably, where, where there's injustice. But I don't know about you, but everything, your spirit is heavy, right? And so Christ says, come to me. Now, some of you may not know what a yoke is because you didn't spend much time on a farm, but a yoke is in that picture. It's how you control large animals, that plus a bit in their mouth and goads behind their feet so they don't kick. But a yoke is put around the neck. You strap two animals together in this case, and that's what the, the person would use to till a field. You know, if you can think about a, a large cow or a bull or, you know, something like that, that is used to work. And so sometimes we forget that we either put on the yoke of slavery in sin, or we put on the yoke of righteousness through Christ. I, I don't know about you guys, but you need to not forget there are only two choices. We are being foolish to think that we are not yoked either as a slave to sin or to righteousness through Christ. There are literally only two choices. And Christ is reminding us his words, red letters. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. He will give you rest. You will work. You will work for the Lord uh, because you know, and it's, it's a pleasure to get a pro the opportunity to work in the presence of the Lord. Adonai, sovereign Lord. Colossians 1.16 says, For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. It's very similar to John 1.1. You know, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Colossians 1.16 is, is further unpacking that truth. Everything that we see, everything that we don't see, is created. It is not random. And if you're listening to this and you have questions about, well, I believe in a God, and I believe in Jesus, and I believe that everything happens randomly in the, in the sense of a macroevolution, that everything came from a Big Bang, that they're actually... You know, you're, you're, I would ask you to hit pause and think about the complications of that thought process. Because if everything is created, that's one trajectory. If everything is not created, that's an inconsistently in a different trajectory. And sometimes Christians, just like any other human, you don't want to deal with these hard truths. And I encourage you. But more than anything, if you want a personal relationship with your sovereign Lord, your ruler, my ruler. We have to acknowledge that it was created by him, through him, for him. And what's awesome is he promises for his children, those that are then called in Christ, that he blesses us. All things were created by him. So we're going to cover three things, how Adonai is our shield, Adonai is our satisfaction, Adonai, salvation. Of course, through Jesus Christ as humans living in the year 2020, uh, we are blessed to be able to have a relationship with the Father through Jesus Christ. That is not something that Old Testament people, if you're reading the Old Testament, they did not have that privilege. But as New Testament believers, we have the opportunity to approach the throne of grace with confidence directly through Christ. It's really a blessing, and it's a lesson for another day. So let's look at this. What is God's calling and purpose? Now, granted, that could be an entire sermon or an entire set of lessons, but for today, just let's, let's maybe make it a smaller. Let's say that God's calling and purpose holistically is it's for his glory and it's for his perfection to be reflected in your life or my life. That's a fair assessment. Once we've called on the name of Christ, certainly we are to live for him. But quite frankly, I believe what Colossians 1.16 says in everything that exists, that I can see or that I cannot see, was created by him, for him, through him, and for his glory and perfection. So 
you know, there is, it's a reflection, kind of like the moon. The moon has no power. All it can do is reflect the sun. And I think Christians, we would do well to remember that. You got to put yourself in the direction of where the sun is shining so that we can be a reflection back to a dark earth and a dark world. So the armor of God is what the picture shows. Ephesians 6, 10 through 17 is the passage of the armor of God. And this isn't a, an armor that, you know, you, you want to have bravado and you're, you know, you're going to be a tough guy and you're going to be Rambo or whatever. It's, it's designed to prove that when God calls you, God provides for you. How awful would it be for God to say, no, go fight this battle. But I give you no protection, no provision. I'll just see you on the other side. Because there are people who believe that literally that the creator got everything going and backed off and said, good luck. I'll see you later. That's not what scripture teaches. Scripture teaches that he goes ahead of us and we get to walk in the blessings. All we have to choose to do is be obedient. That is obedience. And as a matter of discipleship, I would encourage you at a minimum every day, remember to put on this armor. It's, it's armor for us because we need the protection. Be strong in the Lord, in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil, the flaming arrows, which we'll read in a second. I want, to, I want you to see that I underline verse 12. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Y'all, as we like to say here in the South, we got to stop fighting against other humans. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Scripture says it right here. It's against the rulers, the authorities, the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Now, that may be supernatural, and it may be mind-blowing, it may be unsettling, but that's what Scripture says. We're not wrestling with my black friend or my white friend or brown friend or my female or my male. No, we got to stop that. I mean, it's, it's, that is not biblical love, y'all. But we do wrestle and we do strive against evil. We do. If you don't think evil exists, I'm not certain that you're paying attention. Evil exists. We don't like to talk about evil because to talk about evil, really, quite frankly, when you think about it, to talk about evil shows that there is truth. There is love. There's like the opposite. Evil is the absence of it. Evil is not a creative force. It is the absence of that. It's the withdrawal of that that we call and know to be truth and love. So therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, you can stand firm. Stand. Fasten on the belt of truth. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Have your feet ready. Put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Take up your shield of faith. And that, that shield in the picture is not quite as big as they really were. The shield, as they understood it, was a full body shield. You could stand behind it. So you can extinguish the arrows of the evil one. Put on your helmet of salvation. Put on the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Did you know that? The one offensive weapon, if you will, that we're given is the word of God. That's it. It's not our might. It's not our mind. It's not our strength. The only thing by which we can have an offensive posture is the word of God. So you better know it because that determines how, you know, how strong and how sharp your sword is. And lastly, pray and pray some more. Pray at all times. Keep alert with perseverance and make supplication for the saints. Meaning when you're praying, pray for other people, pray for other Christians. Do you ever do that? When you're having your time, you think, I mean, this person's name has come to mind again. A, stop and pray for them. And I would suggest B, reach out to them and say, hey, just want you to know you're on my mind. More than that, the Spirit put you on my mind and I was praying for you. They may or may not, you know, it, it's not about how they respond. It's about you being obedient. I encourage you. The armor of God is very important. It's a, it's a lesson all into itself because there's a lot to unpack of all those different components of the armor. We're not going to do that today. The point of today is that the sovereign Lord of everything didn't just put you out the pasture, so to speak. He didn't put on his yoke and say, good luck. He goes ahead of us. He prepares. He protects. He proceeds. 
it's a really awesome blessing. So let's look at another aspect. If I believe, which I do personally, and if you believe, which I hope you do personally, that this Lord is sovereign, that means that this Lord, this master, is able to provide for all of my needs, all of them. So satisfaction found in Psalm 103, which we're going to read a little bit of. Satisfaction is defined as the fulfillment of a need or a want. It's also the state of being content. But look at that middle one. It's also a discharge of a legal obligation or claim. I say that because we're going to read here in a second about salvation. The point of Jesus Christ being our sacrifice, being our propitiation, being some other big fancy words that we're not talking about today. They're very important, but we're not talking about today. Is that we have an obligation to the creator to deal with our failure, our sin. Unfortunately, there is no way for a human to fulfill that legal obligation except through Christ. So when we talk about Christ being our satisfaction, when we talk about Adonai, God, being our satisfaction, we are also saying, I've satisfied what I owe, but it wasn't me who gave it. It was the Messiah who gave it. Satisfied. And when you think of that word, I picked out some pictures there right on the right. Uh, we're going to talk about that. But let's read Psalms 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul. All that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sin, who heals all your disease, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like eagles. Some of you probably started singing a song in your head, the first two verses, because it's almost exactly a set of lyrics that we now have. But bless him. Proclaim your contentment. Proclaim your satisfaction. But don't stop there. Use that to bless others. Don't forget what the Lord has done for you. I have these pictures over here, right? It's very satisfying to spend time with family. It's a blessing. I mean, do you ever sit back and just, wow, oh, man, I'm, I'm blessed. I am blessed, personally. But I'm sure you listening to this also can attest to how blessed you are. I put a picture of something for those that know me, know that I particularly like certain types of coffee. Uh, and, you know, I, and I'm not probably different than a lot of people when we talk about, you know, physical satisfaction, whether it be coffee or food or whatever. And we can sit down and you can picture that where you, you know, you're drinking that cup of hot chocolate even. You just, oh, wow, I'm so satisfied right now. An hour later, are you still? Two hours later? Well, no, because nothing in this world can satisfy more than briefly. But we like to pretend that we can find satisfaction in possessions and in a whole host of other things that are bound and determined to always fail us. And then in Isaiah 55 too, it, it reminds us of having the satisfied life. It's not about how much we have. It's about how content we are with what we're blessed with. And again, every single one of these slides could really be their own lesson altogether. But today we're focusing on Adonai. Adonai gives us the ability to recognize that we have a sovereign Lord. So let's, you know, maybe say where the rubber meets the road. Uh, religion versus the relationship. Religion is characterized by mankind's futile attempt to fill the innate void we all have due to being image bearers. Now, th those are my words. I'm sure other people can say it more eloquently or more clearly. But what I'm trying to convey is that religion as a construct is humanity's attempt to fill the void. See, I believe that when Scripture says that we are all made in the image of God, that means that we're all image bearers of the Creator. We're image bearers, meaning it's not physical. He put a need for us to have a relationship back with the Creator. Now, just like he gives us armor, he also provided the means by which to have the relationship back with him. So religion... It's all these rules and responsibilities and, 
you know, and you can think about, you know, Eastern religions talk about having some type of enlightenment. Western religions talks about having logic and reason and all this kind of stuff. And it's religion versus a relationship. There is not any other religion. If you want to think of Christianity as a religion, there is not another one where it focuses on the eternal being or the eternal thing. If you talk about other religions, desiring a personal relationship with the creation like Christianity does. You may have never considered that because you may not study other religions. I tend to because I am curious like that. And that's where there's a strong, strong difference. That's the very core of what scripture teaches from Genesis to Revelation. It's about the creator desiring relationship, how the creator loves his creation. And what's so awesome is it's not because the creator is deficient. Because sometimes we think about how I'm deficient because, you know, I need to have love from some other person. So I have a void that I have to fill. That's what's so awesome. The creator doesn't actually have that. He did. De he desires that, but it's for his glory and his purpose only. Uh, so we get to take joy and we get to take a part of that. So I, I put down a couple passages here and, and they're rather lengthy. You may have been reading them since I've been on the slide for a few seconds. But I'm going to summarize Luke 6. 46 through 49. Christ is talking. And he says, why would you call me Lord, Lord, if you're not going to do what I tell you to? Right? You ever say that? To, you know, if you supervise people, if you have kids or whatever, the, however you have authority over somebody, why do you even call me if you're not going to do what I told you to do? And by the way, if you know what Luke 6 is talking about, it's a tough chapter, uh, but Go back and read it, and you'll see in context where he's saying that. We're foolish to, to call on the Lord, but yet refuse to do that which he's told us to do. Scripture is very clear on a lot of things. And where Scripture is clear, we should not waver one bit. Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them is like somebody who builds their house on a rock. Versus the opposite, if you don't, you're like a person who builds their house on sand. And when the floods rise and the storms come, needless to say, the one that was not built strong on the rock crumbles. John 3. Most people, whether Christian or not, know John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Right? We know that verse. But I love the rest of John 3. So John 3 is talking about Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a religious leader. He was influential. You know, so... He comes to Christ in the dead of night because, you know, he was trying to save face, but he had questions. He didn't understand how Jesus was talking about being born again. How can a man be born again? How can I go a second time into my mother's womb and be born again? Jesus says, as you can see, truly, truly, I say, unless you're born of water in the spirit, you can't enter the kingdom of God. Why? Because that what's born of flesh is flesh, but that what is born of spirit is spirit. The wind blows where it wishes. You hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. For God so loved the world. Now look at verse 17. How many of you knew verse 17 before today? It's one of my favorite passages. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order to save the world through him. Read the rest of chapter 3. You have an opportunity to submit and follow this sovereign Lord. And it truly is a blessing. Right now in today's society, what we need more than anything are more people who will put their ego and their pride and their sense of entitlement and their sense of self, they will put that all on the altar. I am talking to the Christian church at this point. Put all of that so that we can show love, biblical love. Not some other worldly descriptor of love, but biblical love, because we have been touched by the Creator's love. You can't fight hate with hate, but we can show love. Ultimately, when we're doing it, point them back to the Father. Point them back to the Father. If you do something for someone else, Scripture says when you give a cup of cold water and to somebody, 
that you should say that you do it in the name of Christ, not in the name of yourself. It's not for your glory or for your honor. Do it so that the world will see that because we love each other, we're different. But first, you have to recognize the need for a Savior. You have to recognize that everything that you see and experience in life is not random. It's not chaos. It feels like chaos. But it only feels like chaos because we're not the creator. And this isn't designed to answer all of those questions. But those of you that know me know that if you were to buzz me up, we would spend some time talking about it. Because I do believe that truth was truth before I knew it was truth. Without truth, we cannot have peace. We cannot have justice. We cannot have anything. And I can't make up my own truth. We're studying the names of God. We're now on Adonai. Next will be Jehovah. And we're doing it again because the intent is to help us grow, to go from being cowardly to being courageous, to being bold, to being able to share this good news. As scripture says, to be able to give an account of the hope that is within us. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for providing Adonai. Thank you for expressing yourself in a sovereign way so that we can understand that you are our all sufficiency, that you literally provide everything we need. Thank you, God. I pray more than anything as fervently as I ever have that you will indwell us so that we can have your peace, we can have your love, so that it will overflow outside of us onto others that were around God. Give us the strength to stand on your word, even in the face of persecution for desiring peace in your name. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.